The northern lights are actually caused by solar winds interacting with the Earth's magnetic field. So the increased solar wind activity, you're gonna have a higher chance of seeing the aurora. That means if there's increased solar flares or sunspots that are happening, you might have stronger aurora activity that night. All right, this is day one of going and trying to chase the northern lights. We are leaving Rovaniemi because Rovaniemi is completely cloudy, literally cannot see anything. Our goal is to drive up. <laughs> Our goal right now is to drive about. <laughs> Our goal right now is to head up north about two hours and 15 minutes to the town of Levy. And it's supposed to be clear there. We're hoping this is technically the first night that we are chasing it that we see them. We shall see though. See in about two hours. So how do you shoot the northern lights? Well, we're going to talk about three different ways. We have our camera here. We're going to talk about video. We're going to talk about photo and then taking video or photos of it on your iPhone. First things first, you're not always going to know or be able to see the northern lights with your eyeballs. When we were outside, there were a couple times we were looking up at the sky and you literally could not see anything. But when I put my camera on my tripod, took a picture, they showed up. So that is one thing to know is using a camera at long exposure is a great way to kind of test the waters and see if the northern lights are there, even if you cannot see them with your eyes. Another thing that you can do is make sure that you guys are using a wide lens. Like right here, I have the 15 to 35 millimeter. That is our favorite lens in order to shoot astrophotography or the northern lights at all. So with that, let's go ahead and talk about the settings for your camera that we would recommend. So first things first is turn on your camera. All I'm gonna do is go into my camera mode and I'm gonna switch to manual exposure. You're gonna wanna shoot on manual most of the time just because you don't want your ISO to go up to like 500,000 and be super grainy. But that is one of the first things that I'm going to adjust. I like to move my ISO between 1600 and 2500 depending on how bright the northern lights are. For when they are really, really bright, I'm gonna drop my exposure down to 1600 ISO. But when they're really faint and I can barely see them, I'm gonna have to increase increase it up to 2,500. Now let's talk about aperture. When you're trying to take pictures of the Northern Lights, you're going to want your widest aperture. So right now I'm shooting an F 2.8 because this is a F 2.8 lens. If you guys have a 1.4, we would highly recommend shooting on that. If you are shooting on a 4.5 or a 5.6, you might be able to see them. You're just going to have to have a longer exposure or you're going to have to pump your ISO up more. Now the last thing we're going to talk about is shutter speed, and this is going to be the thing that changes the most and has the most effect on how your pictures are going to turn out. Sometimes the northern lights are moving extremely fast, so I'm going to have to make my exposure somewhere between one to three seconds. It can really be that quick. Or when you're taking pictures of the northern lights and they are really faint, I'm going to have to adjust my shutter speed in between four to eight seconds. So you can see how drastically it can change from one second all the way up to eight seconds. And that's typically the thing that I like to change the most. If the northern lights are really popping off, I'm gonna have it at an ISO of 1600, and I'm gonna be shooting at one to three second exposures to capture that. But if they are really faint, I'm gonna be shooting at an ISO of 2500 with my shutter speed being between four and eight seconds. Now, enough about photos, let's talk about video, which is is a little bit more difficult to capture. So when you're taking videos of the Northern Lights, the best thing that you're probably gonna be able to do is take a time-lapse video. Now, since we're shooting on the R5, it does have the capability where I can go into the menu, I can go into time-lapse mode, I can just turn that on, and I can choose interval and choose how long I'm gonna be doing that. So for instance, I'm doing an interval timer, I'm gonna set it to 3600, 4K, auto exposure to each frame. And one trick that I like to do is I go in here and I switch to aperture priority mode. Basically what aperture priority mode is, is I'm gonna put it in the aperture of 2.8 and the camera is going to adjust the shutter speed and the ISO depending on how bright the Northern Lights are. So if you're trying to take a time-lapse of the sky and the Northern Lights start off very faint and you can barely see it, it's going to have a higher ISO and a longer shutter speed. But when the Northern Lights get really, really bright, it's going to automatically adjust that because I have it to set for an exposure to each frame to where I can still take pictures of the Northern Lights, but they're not gonna be blown out as if I was shooting it on manual. You can also do this if you go into photo mode and let's say you do not have that interval setting on your camera. I can go in, go to photos, I can go over to my interval timer, enable this, but instead of keeping it in manual, I'm gonna switch over to aperture priority mode 
on my camera. So that way, even though when it's taking pictures, it's going to constantly adjust my ISO and my shutter speed. And you can put the pictures together in post to create a really beautiful time lapse. The last thing that I want to touch on when you are taking photos or videos on your camera that you are going to want to set your camera to manual focus. When you do this, all I do is flip that over and it's all about finding the correct level of infinity. If you are lucky and you have something to focus on, like for instance, this glass igloo, I can look at the glass igloo, shine some light on it, get my focus and then switch it to manual focus after that. It makes it really easy. So you have your subject and frame like this glass igloo or some trees and then switching it to manual focus so it can still take pictures of that. Another thing to think about when you're taking photos or videos is the Kelvin that your camera is going to be on. If you've ever seen the pictures of the Northern Lights where they look a little too warm or they look a little too cool, we like to put our Kelvin right around 3,500 or 3,400. And we've seen that that is when the Northern Lights turn out the best and the most realistic color when we are shooting them. If you guys want a photo of yourself with the Northern Lights that looks just like this, there's a little trick that you can do. So first things first, I'm going to put my camera on my tripod. After that, I'm going to have the person I'm trying to shoot go in frame. I'm going to hit focus. So that way it focuses on them. I'm going to switch it to manual focus after that. So it's still focused on them. I'm going to take the picture, but as I'm taking the picture, I'm going to grab my phone and I'm going to whip across with my flashlight on my phone. It's called light painting. So that way they get a little bit of light as well as the camera is still taking pictures and exposing for the Northern lights. So that is a super easy hack. One more time, I'm going to get them in focus take the picture, use my flashlight very quickly. It's gonna take a little trial and error. Sometimes they might be overexposed. Sometimes they might be too dark, but you can just adjust how long you have the camera flashlight on them. We wouldn't recommend using a flash when taking pictures of them because it's gonna be a long exposure, but that is a simple little hack to capture on your camera. When you are taking pictures of Northern Lights on your phone, a couple things to remember is you're going to want it once again on a tripod or just putting it up against something where it's completely still. The iPhone is good at detecting how much motion there is. So if I go into my photo mode, I can go into night mode, for instance. And then from there, I have the options to do a one second, three second, five second, or a 10 second exposure. The longer the exposure, the brighter the image is gonna turn out. But once again, that comes with making sure that your camera is on a tripod. The next thing, if you guys are trying to take videos of them, very, very difficult unless the Aurora is going crazy. You can see we got a couple of these videos on our iPhone looking straight up. That is because we in, were in video mode. We had it set to 4K, 30 frames per second, and the Aurora was so bright that we could literally see it coming out from the sky and just capture it on our phone. If it's not that bright and you can't see it, a little hack you can do is go into photo mode and then screen record that so it just is taking video on that crop in and it looks like you're kind of taking video of the Northern Lights. It's just gonna be in photo mode because photo mode does a better job of exposing it for the long exposure during the night. Now, that is how to take photos, videos on your iPhone for the Northern Lights. Let's jump into how do you find them? What are the best apps and how are we finding the Northern Lights when we're out here in Lapland? So before we can go and chase the Aurora, let's kind of get an understanding of what factors we need to be looking out for so that we increase our our chances of actually seeing them. Because if you guys remember last year, we were actually chasing the Northern Lights for seven days around Finland, and we did not see them a single time. Whereas this trip, we've now seen them 11 out of 16 days. So we learned a lot of knowledge that we're we're gonna share right here. Now, when it comes to measuring all of the geomagnetic activity, you might have heard of the KP index. The KP index ranks on a zero to nine scale, and it's a good indicator of seeing how strong the Aurora will be when you are out chasing the Northern Lights. And we typically use a few different apps to figure out what the KP prediction will be for that day. The index has been on average around a two to a six really depends on the solar activity, obviously. Our favorite app that we've been using to check the KP index and all of the solar wind and magnetic field forecasts is just called the Aurora app. It gives you 
forecasts of what the KP index will be along with clouds and other conditions. It gives you live cameras to check. It gives you a map of where the auroral oval is currently showing around the world. And it also gives you a ton of other information and it's free, which is nice. They do have a pro version. We have just been using the free version and it has been 100% accurate. Every single time we've gotten Aurora alerts from this app, we have seen the Northern Lights the past two weeks. So we highly recommend downloading that app. The other other app that we would recommend is called Space Weather Live. They also have a website if you don't want to download the app. Space Weather Live it gives you real-time data on solar wind speed and the interplanetary magnetic field. And so if you guys see on that app that there's higher solar wind speeds in a southward IMF, or the BZ component, you can actually have better chances at auroral activity. So since we're also talking about important apps like Space Weather Live and the Aurora app, we can't forget to mention Windy. Windy is a weather forecast app that we find to be extremely accurate all throughout the world. And we love using it to track the clouds. It's super, super accurate. You can find your location and then go into the settings and look at the cloud forecast hour by hour for the rest of the day and even the rest of the week. That is how we determined where we're going to be hunting that night. For example, like we are out here near Levy. Levy was completely cloudy last night, so we could drive an hour away to get out of the clouds and pinpoint exactly where the clouds would be based on using Windy, and that is such a huge help. That's what we've really been relying on when we do see cloudy weather, so we can see where else nearby in Lapland is clear and hopefully be able to see the Aurora. The last app that we'd recommend downloading is called Meteo Agent. And this actually gives you an hour by hour play of the KP index, whereas the Aurora app gives you like a day by day KP prediction. This one actually gives you a really nice breakdown of like the KP index each hour of the day when it's gonna be the highest. So like, let's say, you know, I, I mentioned that the Aurora will typically come out from 9 p.m. to 2 a.m. This will tell you which of those hours your KP index is gonna be the highest. So you can kind of expect how late you're gonna be up that night. This is actually recommended from a guy we met while out shooting in Lofoten Islands. And he says that he swears by it. So that has also been a helpful app as well. So this week, what we've learned is it, you could have perfect conditions and perfect conditions means you have a clear sky, no clouds you have some sort of like good prediction on the KP index and there's no light pollution. So you are not like in the middle of a city. Right now we're in the middle of the wilderness <laughs> in, in a very far out there hotel. So we had perfect viewing conditions last night. If you have those three things, then you theoretically should be putting yourself in a good spot to hopefully see the Aurora. But you might not still see them even if you have all three of those things because the auroral activity might just not be strong enough. And what we've seen in the past couple days where we haven't seen them and we've had all those beautiful conditions is that the solar wind speeds were northward IMF instead of southward. If you see it flip southward instead of northward, we've seen it literally with our own eyes. The second it flips southward, we look up and then all of a sudden they're on the horizon if you have those three conditions. So that has been our experience this week. Those are some good things to keep an eye out for. So checking. Now the thing about the KP index when you are above the Arctic Circle, we have been above the Arctic Circle this whole trip. Rovaniemi in Finland is literally on the line for the Arctic Circle. Is KP index is not as big of a factor when it comes to being above the Arctic Circle because you are in the auroral oval, which means you can have a KP1 or a KP2 and you can still see them super bright above. Whereas the more south you go below the Arctic Circle, you would need a much higher KP prediction in order for you to actually see the lights. Don't get dogged down in the KP index because there are other factors that play more of a role in whether or not you're gonna potentially see the Aurora the day you were hunting them. The time of the Aurora and what time of year that you're gonna wanna be hunting for them. So we are currently out here in March. We are here over the equinox actually, which is tomorrow. And one of the reasons we chose that is because the equinox typically is correlated with some higher auroral activity. No one for sure knows why, but there's a ton of theories behind it and I'm not a scientist, so I'm not gonna get bogged down in it. But typically, 
over the equinox in March and in September, you will find associated increases in seeing the Northern Lights. Now that's not always the case, but a lot of the Aurora chasers that we've talked to will say the equinox effect basically gives you a higher chance of seeing the Aurora. You can see the Aurora out here in Lapland anywhere from September to April. It just really depends on the conditions, of course, but most people typically say that September, October, and March are gonna be your best bet for Aurora, particularly because it's still nice weather so that the clouds aren't completely clouding you out. Last year in January, when we came out here, we got 100% cloud coverage every single day, which means we saw no Aurora. So that is why like the nicer summer months, fall months, and going into spring, you're gonna have better weather, not only for Aurora, but also for doing other activities when you're not just out all night chasing the Aurora. Now, in terms of time of day, you're gonna wanna be looking at around 9 p.m. to 2 a.m. is statistically when you're most likely going to see the Aurora. For us, in the past two weeks of being out here, we've actually seen them more on the early side, which has been great for us. Uh, they've been coming out around 9 p.m. most nights and then around midnight the other nights, but it really fluctuates. Typically between nine and midnight is what we've seen. We haven't had to stay up much, much later to actually see them, but that is the core like time zone of when you're gonna be out Aurora hunting. And last but not least, let's talk about the colors and the variability of the Aurora because every single night we've seen it, it has been completely different. So when it comes to the color of the Aurora, we've actually mainly been seeing like greens and purples. It's purple! And an occasional like blue. The different colors of the Aurora are determined by the type of gas molecules involved and the altitude at which the interactions are occurring. So when the oxygen molecules are high in the atmosphere, you can actually see a lot more rare red Auroras. But the more common colors are the green lights, which occur when charged particles collide with oxygen at lower altitudes. That is what we've typically gotten in the past two weeks and the nitrogen molecules can produce blue or purplish red aurora so we also saw some of those as well on like the kp6 nights and then last but not least when it comes to like the strength of the aurora we have seen it on nights where you can't see it with the naked eye but you can see it with a camera we've seen it where you can see it with the naked eye but it's like far away and it's just kind of like an arc or a line and then we've also seen it where it went absolutely ballistic above you overhead and it's just dancing like crazy for hours on end oh Oh, the purple right above us. Where? Purple. It's right above us. It's showing up. Each of these situations, completely different experiences. It's not saying that one happens more than the other, but when you're chasing, don't set your expectations too high because you really don't know what kind of night you're gonna get. Those really crazy dancing overhead nights are not as common as just like being able to see it. The Aurora kind of looks like a cloud to the naked eye, like a tinted cloud on the nights that it's a little weaker that you might only be able to pick it up on camera. But when you can see it with your naked eye, it's usually some sort of like nice line or arc in the sky. The intensity and occurrence of the displays really are just influenced by the activity of the sun, solar flares and CME, which is coronal mass ejections can dramatically increase the intensity of solar wind, which leads to more spectacular aurora. And that is typically when you can actually see the aurora at lower latitudes below the Arctic Circle. So it really just depends on what conditions you're getting out here. There's no guarantee to see them as we've learned the hard way, but knowing all this can help you increase your chances. And we recommend downloading the Windy app to keep track of your cloud forecasts. If you have a good KP prediction or you're above the Arctic Circle and you're out of light pollution, you're setting yourself up for success. You might have to drive a little bit out of the way, like the first night when we were in Rovaniemi, we were completely clouded in, but if we drove two hours north to Levy, we were out of the clouds and we were able to see them. So it just kind of takes some commitment and a rental car in order to chase the lights based on those conditions to increase your chances. Thank you so much for watching our ultimate guide to chasing the Aurora or the Northern Lights. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and hit subscribe for more fun bucket list adventures like this, and we will see you on the next adventure.